Good morning. I thought yesterday was uh, outstanding, really stimulating, a lot that we, have to ha we talked about, and I hope today will be just as stimulating. Today's panelists and panel is focusing on journalism and journalists at risk, although, as I was saying to someone outside just a moment ago, in many ways, everything we've been talking about is about journalism, and in many ways, journalism is about the things we talked about uh, yesterday. So these categories are uh, constantly morphing, although I think it was Michael Schudson, I think I have this right, who wrote that if there were no professional journalists, we'd have to invent them. Um, so, uh, so focusing on journalism as the final panel seems to make a lot of sense. I'm going to uh, moderate the panel. Uh, which is a pretty simple task. I'll make brief introductions, very brief, because you have more detailed introductions of our panelists in your um, uh, booklet. Uh, we'll go in the order that they're listed, um, and each one will have 10 minutes to uh, give their initial presentation. We have an added treat. Um, at the end, after the four panelists present, uh, we have a short video put together by Claire Wardle, who, we had, who is the um, research and strategy director at First Draft, a nonprofit dealing with many of the issues we've been talking about. And she, we had hoped she'd be able to be here. She wasn't able to, but she did put together a little video that we'll uh, present at the end. And then, as before, the most, uh, one of the most important parts of the, each of the panels, we'll open it up to questions from our interlocutors as well as the general audience. So without further ado, let me get started. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Arzu Gabula, um, who was a freelance writer from Azerbaijan and living in, I, I've read two different things, living in exile in Turkey and then living in exile in Washington, DC. So I'm not sure we're, Turkey now, okay. Um, uh, so we're really happy to have Arzu here. Uh, next will be Parker Higgins who is the Director of Special Projects at the Freedom of the Press Foundation. He is an artist, activist, and developer. Uh, following um, that will be uh, Jay Rosen, a longtime friend uh, and a great scholar and, act and activist and practitioner. Jay has been teaching journalism at New York University since 1986 and is author, uh, is, is author of Press Think, a blog about journalism, and I hope you all uh, have followed that because it's really an innovative um, blog that has lots to say about the things we've been talking about here. And then finally, another longtime friend, Silvio Weisbord, who is a professor at the School of Media and Public Affairs at George Washington University and is, at least for a little while longer, editor-in-chief of the Journal of Communication. Uh, you can read more details about all four of our uh, accomplished uh, panelists in your brochure, but I think we mostly want to hear from them. So with that, I'll ask Arzu if she will start us off. I think I'll be another short person standing here. Um, well, thank you for having me here. <clears throat> um, I think the best way to illustrate the state of journalism in Azerbaijan is actually by taking you back to April 11th, uh, which, is, which was the presidential elections in Azerbaijan. Now, these were snap uh, presidential elections because we were supposed to have them in October. But the president decided that uh, you know, it was time for snap elections and we scheduled. Um, and so on April 11th, Azerbaijan went into um, elections. But I wouldn't really call that election because Azerbaijan hasn't really had independent elections since 1993. Because that's when the father of the current president um, came to power, Haider Aliyev. And he stayed in power until his son, uh, uh, Ilham Aliyev, who is the current president, replaced him. Uh, now, the only reason why he replaced his father was because his father passed away. And I fear that um, the current president uh, is preparing his son, whose name is also Haider Aliyev, for the next presidential seat. But the wife is actually first because she's been appointed vice president uh, recently. So we have a family that's been running the country for quite a long time. Now, what was really interesting about these elections, aside from the fact that they weren't really elections, but more of like a show, uh, was the day after the elections. Because the International Observation Mission 
um, that was uh, consisting of the OCO DIR and the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, held a press conference. And of course, the results that they were presenting uh, weren't very positive. Um, they had long-term and short-term observation mission in the country. And this press conference was happening at a hotel. And on one side, you had pro-government media representatives. And on the other side, you had independent opposition uh, media representatives. And it's always like this. I've done observation, uh, election observation in Azerbaijan, and always the next day, the press statements are like that. You have one side of the room occupied by the government journalists and then the other by the opposition independent journalists. Uh, I think it was minute five. I was watching the stream, the live stream of the, of the press statement. But I think it was minute five when the Odir representative started <laughs> talking about all the critical findings that, they, that they observed during the elections, you know, starting from the ballot stuffing to carousel voting to all other violations. All of a sudden, you had this amazing performance staged by the pro-government media. They started yelling. They started accusing the independent observers of of coming with an agenda, of um, pro coming, coming to Azerbaijan, uh, misusing the hospitality of the country, and uh, presenting the results of the elections that you know, didn't really take place in Azerbaijan, because the country that they were talking about was not Azerbaijan. And they continued yelling, and it, it, it took such, such so long time that the observers had to leave the room. They had to leave the room for like 10 minutes until everyone quieted down. And Watching them live on a screen, it felt like the more aggressive you yelled and the redder your face became, you would get more gold stars from your editors or from the media council, which is the state body that keeps the media under control. Um, but that is the sad reality of journalism in Azerbaijan, because you have these pro-government journalists who work uh, either um, at media that's owned by the government or by the people close to the government, and you have the independent journalists. Now, the government, pro-government journalists, what they do is they get free housing because of the excellent reporting that they do. They get really good salary because of the excellent reporting that they do. Um, they are really skillful at creative writing because much of their reporting is based on basically made up facts. You know, statistics that are not real, um, development that is not real, and so on and so forth. Now what they're really also good at is kissing up. And let me give you an example. So there's this news agency that's been, um, that was established actually in the beginning of the 90s. And they have television, they have radio, they have um, uh, uh, their own little uh, sub-media platforms. And the guy who runs this uh, platform, this news agency, is notorious for bashing um, opposition, for bashing activists, and basically discrediting everyone who says anything critical of the government at any point. Now, at some point, he made a mistake. Um, he wanted to publish an interview with Gulen, which he did, uh, his correspondent did, in um, uh, DC at a press conference. Uh, and that was at the time when Turkey was having its own issues with Gulen. Uh, it was right after the coup. And a lot of the Gulen affiliated businesses were shut down, media outlets were shut down. So what happened to him was that his media outlet, the news agency, was shut down. The license was revoked immediately because he just made that decision, independent decision, of publishing that interview. Now, what he did and this is just really an incredible example. He wrote a letter to the dead president. He wrote a letter to Heydar Aliyev um, asking for an apology and guidance to help him to come back to journalism. And he did. He just created an, a new television channel where he basically continues to do what he did at the news agency. And most of the staff is the, his staff from the news agency. Now, this is what happens to the government supporters, the media, the, the journalists who work for pro-government. Now, on the other side, you have the independents. And the risks and the threats and the sources of the threats are much higher. You can get beaten, uh, which is quite normal and very common. You can get blackmailed. You can get intimidated. You can be arrested, and you can be charged with bogus charges. Um, you can be murdered. 
uh, you can be subject to online harassment, uh, you can be discredited, defamed, and all of these have examples. You know, I have friends who've been blackmailed. I myself have been subject to, um, I guess, patriotic trolling, which was actually mentioned yesterday. Um, and I've been discredited at international conferences by the government representatives who were sent there to just do that. Um, I've been defamed. I've been um, described a traitor and a foreign agent back home. And all of this was because I was working for an, a Turkish Armenian newspaper in Istanbul. And actually, just two days ago, there was this article about me um, by a pro-government media outlet um, based on an anonymous letter that the editor received. Um, and the author of this letter uh, basically said that, oh, I knew the father of Arzu. And he was a great man. And he always praised this country. And as I was reading, I was like, this is really strange, because my father never praised the country. <laughs> he never said anything uh, good about the economy, because he was an economist, and he was always really frustrated by the way the uh, authorities were actually you know, <laughs> using the economy and the revenues for their own benefit. And there was one other thing I found was in 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 very funny, was that he said, so where was she when her father was the rector of the University of Civil Engineering? And I'm like, I was actually in middle school. And I wasn't really active at that time. But OK. And this is the type of you know, stuff that you get when you are you know, a journalist with an independent mind. And it's, it's, it's really funny, because what they don't understand, what this, what this government media doesn't understand, is that every time they come up with this kind of way of responding to your work is actually they, they make themselves look really bad and really weak. But, you know, that's, that's very, um, that's, that's a very sad reality of, of journalism. But the risks are still high, um, and that is the unfortunate reality. Um, and it's still incredible to see the drive of independent journalism in Azerbaijan despite the risk. You know, I have uh, a friend who is the great investigative journalist, she has been blackmailed with sex tapes. She has been um, put behind bars. She was sentenced to seven and a half years on bogus charges. And yet, she came back. Uh, she was released early. She has a travel ban, so she can't travel. She was not even allowed to go and pick up her mother who died while she was being treated in Ankara. And yet, she continues doing reporting. You know, she continues doing investigative job her investigative reporting. And for me, this is, I guess, the, the positive and, and the motivation. Because there are so many bad examples of journalism that I feel like what we have, the small community of independent journalists that there is in Azerbaijan, is what keeps us together. Um, and I'll finish here. And I'm looking forward to the questions. Thank you. All right, hi everybody. Um, my name is Parker Higgins. I'm, uh, as was mentioned, the director of special projects for the Freedom of the Press Foundation. Uh, some of you may know, can I get a show of hands? Do, do people, have people heard of the Freedom of the Press Foundation? Okay, about half, that's good. Um, we are a uh, nonprofit doing press freedom advocacy work in a number of areas, and I'm gonna be talking about some of those areas today and talking specifically about uh, protecting journalists in the age of Trump. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to say thanks to, uh, to Barbie and the organizers. This has been a very thought-provoking um, and, uh, and well-programmed event so far. Um, and it's really given me a lot to think about over the last couple of days. Um, and, of course, one of the luxuries of speaking on the last panel is that I can point to some of those things that came before and, and draw some through lines uh, that have come up in a number of panels and, and uh, and I think it, it's apt to point out that we're talking about journalism, but a lot of the things that have come before are, are things that affect journalists, um, and, and, and uh, uh, there's a lot of commonalities between these. Um, one of the through lines I wanted to point to, so we do, one of the major things that we do at the Freedom of the Press, <coughs> Freedom of the Press Foundation is security trainings. Uh, we do trainings inside newsrooms for journalists uh, in 2017. We did trainings for somewhere north of a thousand individual journalists, um, and 
we train people on uh, secure, secure communication software and ways that they can talk with each other and talk with sources um, and save their notes and that sort of thing. Um, and one of the important things about that training is the first step that you ever that you do in any any good security training uh, is you talk about um, threat modeling. And threat modeling is kind of an intimidating phrase for some people, um, but it's basically just risk assessment. And uh, you think about uh, what risks you face and uh, and what you're trying to keep secure and what the consequences of losing that security would be. Um, and you also think about who the adversary is and uh, what the consequences are. Um, and that, of course, speaks to uh, to Soraya's point on the on the first day of, of who gets to decide what a risk is. And I think that one of the things that we learn talking to journalists and, you know, again, talking to, to many dozens or hundreds of journalists is that everyone has a different idea of what the risks are. Um, and that's, uh, it's, it's important to be when you're making tools and when you're providing suggestions to accommodate all those different kinds of risks. Um, there's another uh, through line there uh, that that brings up, which is that you can't effectively mitigate a risk that you don't understand. And of course, it's hard to understand a risk that you can't measure. Um, and we saw that uh, yesterday with Maria's discussion of, I thought this was very interesting, um, Duterte distorting the number, the, the number of people killed in the drug war by recategorizing uh, which, which deaths counted. So not disputing individual deaths, but saying this, this is in a different column. Um, and we saw that, of course, again, uh, when Sam talked about his uh, organization's work in tracking police violence. This is something that politically uh, the federal government does not keep, keep records of. And so it's a political act to keep that record. Um, and so in that way, counting is political. And of, of course, that goes back to you know, who counts and who gets counted, which, is, which came up in Soraya's talk as well. Um, to that end, one of the major things that we've been doing over the past year at Freedom of the Press Foundation, uh, along with the Committee to Protect Journalists, is we've established the US Press Freedom Tracker in August of 2017. Um, and this is a, a public website and database that tracks uh, incidents such as when journalists are arrested in the US, <coughs> when their equipment is seized, uh, when they're physically attacked, and when they receive subpoenas related to their work. And this is the sort of thing that, you know, even just a couple of years ago, uh, it may have been such a small number that it didn't seem worth tracking, but actually we don't have information from a couple of years ago. We basically have one, years of, one year of solid information that we'll, we'll be able to compare going forward. Um, in 2017, in the US, there were 34 arrests of US journalists uh, that were arrested while doing their job. 88% um, of those arrests took place at protests or rallies. Uh, there were 44 physical attacks on journalists doing their job. 70% uh, of those happened at protests or rallies. Uh, in five cases, those physical attacks were by law enforcement officers. Incredibly, in two of those, in two of those cases, the attacks were committed by politicians. Um, and we probably, there was a, uh, we, I think everyone knows uh, one of those when Ben Jacobs of The Guardian um, was body slammed by Greg Gianforte on the, thank you, on the uh, eve of, of Gianforte's election. Um, and, uh, and part of the, the civil set settlement for that involved uh, Gianforte donating $50,000 to the Committee to Protect Journalists, which was used to fund the tracker. So it kind of comes full circle. Um, we also track uh, what we call chilling statements, uh, including many uh, statements that are chilling to the freedom of the press by the president himself. Um, and often they're, they're sort of vague threats against the concept of fake news. Uh, but in many cases, he's called out individual journalists by name uh, and, and called for them to be fired from their, from their news outlets. Uh, he was doing this today, uh, if you've checked Twitter. Um, he's also gestured broadly at changes to the law, saying we need to, quote, you know, open up libel law. Um, and of course, just this weekend, so I mean, it's an embarrassment of examples. Um, just this weekend, uh, the Comey memos were released. Um, and one of, the, one of the anecdotes in the Comey memos was the president calling in private for uh, journalists to be jailed. And, uh, and it should be noted that Comey didn't disagree with that. He laughed along with the joke. Um, so we make all this information available online. Uh, it's sorted and tabulated, and we encourage other people working in the field to use that data. Um, 
And you know, it's, again, we've only got one year of data, but we intend to keep doing this, uh, and we'll be able to make comparisons and see how that, that's developing. So there's that counting, and then uh, once we've got a sense of that risk, there's also the work we do to protect those journalists and their sources. Um, in 2018, nowadays, uh, a lot of that is uh, not just instructing people on the use of secure communication software, but developing and maintaining those technical tools for secure communication. Uh, most prominently, the way we do that is with a tool called SecureDrop, which is a whistleblower submission system. Uh, SecureDrop is designed to make it uh, such that whistleblowers don't have, to, don't have to be security experts to make the right decisions to uh, protect their identity when they're communicating with journalists. Um, and that requires uh, a lot of development on our end. It uses um, the, the Tor network and, and uh, forces sources to, uh, to use, to download the Tor browser to communicate in that way. And ideally when this is done, uh, even the journalist is not able to tell through the communication who their source is. Um, of course, frequently journalists do follow up work uh, and, and can talk with sources, but uh, that's designed to protect sources from uh, their, their journalists getting subpoenaed for that information. So in many cases, they don't know. Um, a funny thing is that because this is security software and because we take this very seriously, we don't keep, we, we don't have any way of knowing uh, exactly how frequently th this software is being used. Um, we do get uh, positive feedback from uh, journalists. It's rarely cited in stories, but we have been told that it's been uh, the, the source of stories. Um, uh, we did get one report uh, that mentioned that when the New Yorker installed it, they started getting um, poetry submissions through it. So that's not, <laughs> it's not how it's supposed to be used, but. Um, but of course, uh, so, and, and this is, by the way, uh, there are dozens of installations. Uh, it's at the New York Times, at the Washington Post, USA Today, Associated Press. It's at, um, at dozens, almost every major newsroom uh, in the U.S. and across the world. Um, and, and that's growing. Uh, and we, we often install it, but it's free software, and so people can install it themselves. Uh, but of course, the need for SecureDrop underlines an important point about the threat that journalists face under Trump, which is that they have been exacerbated by this administration, but they aren't new. We started developing, or we took over SecureDrop before this administration, um, and uh, the Obama administration prosecuted more whistleblowers under the Espionage Act than all previous administrations combined. So this isn't a right or left issue, it's one of democratic ideals, which I think uh, some of the other panelists will speak to. Um, and finally, we can't talk about uh, protecting journalists without talking about protecting the institutions of journalism. Um, and uh, I hope to speak to this more in the Q&A, but um, as the director of special projects, I have a little bit of license within Freedom of the Press Foundation to think more broadly about the issues and to think about how we can support the institutions that journalists rely on. Um, for me, that has mostly manifested in the last several months in uh, thinking about archiving and preservation of work as we see more and more attacks on news outlets that come in the form of a, uh, of a wealthy uh, you know, business person either buying the outlet and shutting it outright or uh, launching legal attacks or bankrolling legal attacks against the outlet. So uh, I've, I've done a lot of archiving work with um, Gothamist and with uh, Gawker and with a number of other outlets. Um, and more frequently, I've been, or more recently, sorry, I've been focused on, uh, on a project called FOIA Feed. That's on Twitter, at FOIA Feed, um, which highlights the use of the Freedom of Information Act uh, at major papers um, and, uh, and shows, highlights the, this important tool. Um, hopefully, uh, in case it comes under attack, uh, we, can, we can show the important journal that that's been produced with it. So that's my time, and I'm looking forward to the other panelists and questions. Thank you. Just to add a little detail to what Parker said, um, in the Comey memos when Trump mentions we should throw a couple of journalists in jail, he says they make a new friend and then they have a different attitude, which I believe is a reference to prison rape. That wasn't part of my talk, so subtract that from my time. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me, Barbie, and congratulations on your center. As we meet, there is a live in the land, 
an organized campaign to discredit the American press. This campaign is succeeding. Its roots are long. For decades, the Republican coalition has tried to hang together by hating on elites who claim to know stuff, like what is art, or what should college students be taught, or what counts as news. The media wing of this history extends back to Goldwater's campaign in 1964. It passes through Agnew's speeches for Nixon in 1969 and winds forward to our own time through William Rusher's 1988 book, The Coming Battle for the Media, through the growth of conservative talk radio, and in the spectacular success of Fox, which found a lucrative business model in resentment news, culture war, and the battle cry of liberal bias. Donald Trump is both the apotheosis of this history and its accelerant. He has advanced the proposition dramatically. From undue influence, which was Agnew's claim, to something closer to treason, enemy of the people. Instead of criticizing the media for unfair treatment, as Agnew did, Trump whips up hatred for it. Some of his most demagogic moments have been attacks on the press often while pointing directly at reporters and camera crews. Nixon seethed about the press in private. Trump seethes in public, which is a very different act. The campaign to discredit the press starts at the top with the president's almost daily attacks on the fake news and his description of key institutions the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, NBC, as both failing and corrupt. At the bottom of the pyramid is an army of online trolls and alt-right activists who shout down stories critical of the president and project hatred at the journalists who report them. Between the president at the top and the base at the bottom, are the mediating institutions, Breitbart, Drudge Report, Daily Caller, Rush Limbaugh, and especially Fox News. The campaign operates differently on the three major sectors of the electorate. For core supporters, media hate helps frame the president as a fighter for them. I will put these people down for you, was one of the most attractive promises Trump made during the campaign, and he has delivered on that pledge. They, in turn, deliver for him by categorically rejecting news reports that are critical of the president in the belief that journalists are simply trying to bring their guy down. <clears throat> on his committed opponents, the president's political style works by inviting ridicule and attack. Their part in the script is simply to keep the culture war going. The anger, despair, and disbelief that Trump inspires in his doubters is felt as confirmation, consumed as entertainment by his supporters. If Trump's opponents defend or even reference the reporting of an elite institution like the New York Times, that only supports his campaign to discredit the press as a merely ideological institution. Then there's the third group, Americans who are neither committed supporters nor determined critics of Donald Trump. On them, the campaign to discredit the press works by generating noise and confusion, raising what economists call the search costs for good information. If the neither nors give up and pay less attention, that is a win for Trump, the polarizer in chief. So that's my short course on how the campaign to discredit the American press works. Now let me turn to our subject, the risks. I have a list. 
some of these are already are in the already happened category. There is a risk that one third of the electorate will be isolated in an information loop of its own where Trump becomes the major source of information about Trump. That has already happened. An authoritarian system is up and running for that portion of the polity. Before journalists log on in the morning, one third of their public is already gone. There is a risk that Republican elites will fail to push back against Trump's attacks on democratic institutions, including the press, even though these same elites start their day by reading the New York Times and the Washington Post. This too has already happened. There is a risk that journalists could do their job brilliantly and it won't really matter because Trump supporters categorically reject it, Trump opponents already believed it, and the neither nors aren't paying close enough attention. In a different way, there is a risk that journalists could succeed at the production of great journalism and fail at its distribution because the platforms have taken over the organizing of public attention. There is a risk that the press will lose touch with the country, fall out of contact with the culture. Newsroom diversity is supposed to prevent that, but the diversity project has itself been undermined by a longer and deeper project, which I have called in my writing, The View from Nowhere. The press is at risk of losing its institutional footing. For example, in the hands of Sean Spicer and Sarah Sanders, the White House briefing has gone to ruin. It was always frustrating. Now it's useless and even counterproductive. Many floors below the surface of journalism, there are bedrock attitudes that make the practice possible in the first place. There is a risk of erosion there. One example is the belief that there exists a common world of fact that can be established through inquiry. When the President of the United States forcefully rejects that premise, any practice that rests upon it is in political trouble. It used to be that when the American president went abroad, the American press came with. There would be a joint press conference with the foreign head of state. Often, this would be the only time the host country's press corps got to question their leader. In these moments, the American government and the American press worked together to show the strong men of the world what a real democracy was. All that is now at risk. When Donald Trump met the president of China in November of 2017, there was no joint press conference. The Chinese didn't want it. The State Department failed to push for it. There is a risk that established forms of journalism will be unable to handle the strain that Trump's behavior puts on them. For example, the form we used to call fact-checking has had zero effect in preventing him from repeating falsehoods. There is a risk that the press will hang on to these forms well past their sell-by date because it's what they know and they want things to be normal. For example, access to confusion and disinformation serves no editorial goal, but access journalism is alive and well in White House coverage. I will close with something Steve Bannon put to the great author Michael Lewis. The Democrats don't matter, said Bannon. 
The real opposition is the media. And the way to deal with them is to flood the zone with shit. To this kind of provocation, Marty Baron, editor of the Washington Post, has a succinct reply. We are not at war, we're at work. We're not at war, we're at work. I think our top journalists are correct that if they become the political opposition to Trump, they will lose. And yet, they have to go to war against a political style in which power gets to write its own story. There is a risk that they will fail to make this distinction in my role as a critic, I have been trying to alert them to the danger, but I can't say it's working. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you, Barbie, and everybody else for, for having me here. It's, it's, it's great to be here. Um, um, Barbie asked me to talk about uh, journalist safety. Um, and the first question, of course, is what can be said that has not been said, especially after a day and a half and the brilliant presentations by my co-panelists. So uh, let's see. I, I became interested in issues related to journalism uh, safety about 25 years ago when I was doing research on uh, investigative journalism in, in Latin America. And I became sort of... Uh, fascinated by the question of how uh, journalists sort of put their life at, at risk in context where sort of some of the basic protections did, did not exist. Uh, and they suffer all kinds of threats and harassment and uh, newsrooms that were bombed and sort of the whole uh, sort of kind of um, attacks, plus trauma and shattered lives and everything else that comes as a consequence of practicing that kind of, of journalism. And what is interesting is that sort of it was a phenomenon sort of across the global south, not unique to, to Latin America. So then what can be said? Where, where are we now? So here's my spoiler alert. I don't have any good news, and my recommendation is that we should leave hope for a better moment right now. Um, I told you. <laughs> There's a glimmer of hope at the very end, but, you know, well, but anyway. So what's the current situation? Well, the current situation is uh, traveling, worsening um, around the world as recent uh, reports produced by a number of freedom of press um, organizations and some new uh, recent stories uh, in the press. Um, there's a number of sort of figures and data and maps that we can use to sort of demonstrate this. One map produced by reporters without borders is, is this. The darker the color, the worse the conditions are for reporters. Um, and it used to be slightly better, let's say, a decade or 15 years ago is becoming uh, uh, worse. Uh, this is about the number of journalists killed by region in, in recent years. Um, so you can get a sense of where the situation is, sort of has been bad, chronically bad for a while, and the situation seems to be worsening in specific regions, in specific um, uh, countries. So we can go on with data sort of demonstrating how bad the situation looks like. So to me the first problem is how do we understand this problem? What is the problem about? And I want to propose here is that we need to approach the question of a journalist at risk, uh, that problem, but basically as a human rights problem. That is, in my mind, the right way of approaching or framing this. That is not just a question of journalist safety. It's fundamentally a question of communication rights that particularly affect journalists as well as ordinary citizens. Um, and second, that journalism, and this was mentioned in the, in the keynote, uh, the journalism is, and people have been using this metaphor recently, remains the canary in the coal mine, a case for human rights. So it's a writ, writ large. It's not just about, about journalism. So my co pilots already describes sort of the, the threats that journalists are confronting. So just a quick summary, the range of threats 
um, legal actions, uh, direct threats on physical safety, uh, sexual harassment, um, verbal attacks, economic punishment. And what is interesting in this is something that sort of, I think, runs through many of the presentations that we heard uh, in the past day and a half, which is who is at risk and who determines who is at risk. And the cases that we know better, at least in the global south, is that reporters who cover specific types of issues are more likely to be at risk or suffer sort of a range of, of threats. Those who cover illegal activities, environmental issues, uh, corruption, government and business collusion, drug trafficking, um, insurgent movements, conflict, those are particularly vulnerable. But we have known this for a long time, people who have been interested in this question outside of the global north. So to me, in my mind, is when is it that the question of journalist safety becomes a public, a collective, a global problem? Um, when is it and who becomes something that we worry about globally? Um, and that is, to me, the question of the identity, not only of who defines who's at risk, but what type of risk and who is at risk. But also on top of the traditional threats, we have something that already has been said many times here, different forms of online harassment, hacking, doxing, identity um, uh, theft. It's a recent study by uh, Pan America that defines online harassment in this, in this way. I think it's a good working definition of what we're talking about. Um, what are the consequences? The consequences are many. Consequences are individual and collective. Discourage critical report, reporting on free expression. Uh, individual and collective trauma. Financial repercussions. Uh, reputational risks. Defamation campaigns. Investigation backlash. And it's interesting that we have been talking about this for a long time. And look at a recent story by CPJ talking about the current situation in the, in the U.S. And what's What's happening now in the, in, the, in the U.S. actually checks everything that we have been saying for a long time about the causes and the consequences of this process. And let me just show you very quickly this. Um, what is interesting is that we are having now a North, global, a North and south, uh, south conversation about issues that, in principle, have a lot of overlapping. I will not say they are identical, in which sort of the question what journalists are supposed to scrutinize uh, power, power becomes the so power scrutinizes journalists. Uh, the journalists need to figure out the threats on their own, typically, in spite of a range of support that might exist. Uh, my interviews that I conducted with Colombian reporters, I was fascinated by the fact of how their own sources, sources inside the actors that they cover, become the best source of information about the likelihood that something is going to happen to them. Uh, to calibrate the danger, how, when is time to basically stop it? When is time to bail? When is time to go? When is time that you can continue with the story? Um, the trauma that also typically reporters deal by themselves, self-censorship, all this stuff is stuff that we have known for a long time. Um, so what are the causes? Are we, we were asked to sort of figure out the causes of this, and very quickly, um, there are long-term causes, at least in the countries that I know better, statelessness, the, weak of the, rule of, of, the weakness of the rule of, of law. Journalists cannot trust the police. Uh, there are inefficient mechanisms. The state is the perpetrator or is an accomplice. Uh, it's a case of state failure. Um, but at the same time, it's, I think, a political juncture. The current authoritarian, illiberal populist movement coupled with the backlash against progressive gains from the last decades in terms of human rights, freedom of the press, and freedom of speech actually come together. Plus, social currents, anti-human rights crusade, plus the disinterest in ensuring and supporting human rights. Um, in some ways, it's hard to think about whether or not society at large really cares about when these things happen every single day. Um, so what are the responses? The responses, and, and already Parker talked about this, um, there are numbers, there are plenty of action and resources. There's training on ethics, on legal issues, risk analysis. There are a number of publications that 
to, to, to train reporters. There are a lot of practical measures, uh, hotlines, social media alerts, monitoring attacks, safe houses, safety fund for families, first aid, trauma counseling, all the stuff in the countries that I know better, in Mexico, in Brazil, in Colombia, uh, in Central America have been widely uh, implemented, as well as advocacy for better laws for uh, the protection of journalists. Uh, the Journalists in Distress Network, to me, is one of the most interesting initiatives around sort of this set of issues. Um, this story came out yesterday. Uh, again, sort of, there is no shortage of, of resources about how to tackle this. So what is the question? Um, the question to me are the followings. Um, oh, what happened here? Oh, right. Um, what I found out in my, in my research and other researchers have, have found is what actually makes a, a difference. And it, consistently what you find from reporters is the sense that they are alone, in spite of all these sort of networks and institutions that have done tremendous work. That I'm quoting a reporter from a Mexican uh, news site that has been recently um, the, the target of attacks. It continues being the same nightmare, nothing, and no one protects us. Criminals have permission to do as they want. The journalists themselves typically opt for individual solutions because they are skeptical about collective solutions. Collective sort of mobilizations often seems too far, right, from where, where they are. And this all crystallizes in impunity index. Impunity con continues. Um, so what are the questions that I hope can inform the conversation going, going forward? Who cares? Who cares about this? Who cares beyond the freedom of expression, freedom of the press community? The journalists, the NGOs, the international agencies who have done tremendously important work. But who else cares about this? And the problem is that we have reached, at least in the countries that I know better, the naturalization of human rights violation, in spite of the mobilization. Second, who mobilizes? I my sense is that probably these issues lack a broader constituency. And that's probably why we have made sort of reactive efforts, reactive success, rather than proactive, addressing the structural causes that underlie these problems. Which takes me to this. What could make political elites and ordinary citizens pay attention and maintain support through effective actions? And curiously enough, these are not just questions for the global south. These are relevant questions in this country right now. Um, does human rights norm signaling and norm enforcement, which according to the human rights literature has had some success in the last three or four, four decades, do they work on the questions that we are discussing here? I'm not, I'm not so sure about this. Um, so here's my conclusion. What to do, if you ask me just summarize it in one phrase, is basically build a movement. But not only build it. Someone said it's easier building than maintaining something. Well, build and maintain a movement. That's, that's what it is. And I think that what is important for us in academia is to develop, nurture, continue partnerships, universities in the global north and the south, with journalist organizations, with NGOs, and aid agencies. To do what? What is it that we can do? Uh, just some ideas. Document virtuous cases. Where does it work? Where did all this amount of work has basically done effect, has, has changed the situation, has improved the situation? But specifically on how we can broaden the support around these issues. How we can raise social awareness about media at risk and, and safety. In what cases the, the structural conditions that I mentioned earlier were successfully addressed. Training curricula appropriate to local circumstances. I've seen a number of places in which people are trained to be a journalist in places that do not exist, that have, doesn't match the reality in which they are likely to work. Um, and conduct social and political advocacy, because this is really has been the hard nut to crack in terms of how you move forward, rather than only or mainly have ways to, to react when, when the problem exists. Um, so I think there are plenty of opportunities and plenty of, of of needs for not only for this conversation, but actually for concrete actions around um, some of these issues. So that's why I, I, I think it's a great idea to have a center for media at, at risk because it could not be more timely given the current conditions and the fact that we are in the middle of a global conversation 
around these issues in spite of the differences across regions and countries. Thank you very much. So I'm going to see if I can get this video from Claire up. In the meantime, so that as dean, so that our panelists don't sue the Annenberg School for bad necks, I think maybe you could all, if you wanted to sit in the front seat there to watch the video, that might, yeah, come around, yeah. I lead First Draft, a project at the Shorenstein Center at the Harvard Kennedy School. We're focused on information disorder, a term we use to describe all the different elements of our polluted information ecosystem. We work on initiatives in the field where we test different methods and interventions for tackling information disorder. We then research those efforts using academic rigorous methods and use the results to build resources for journalists whether that's online courses on how to verify images or videos sourced from the social web, or it might be best practices for publishing fact checks and debunks, or it could be guidelines for reporting on disinformation to prevent unnecessary oxygen amplifying claims. And increasingly, the aim of those orchestrating these information campaigns is exactly that. This summer, we'll be building a lab at Harvard to monitor attempts at manipulating the mainstream media, those who are targeting journalists, and we'll be doing that by sending out alerts and advisories to national and local newsrooms in the lead up to the midterms to try to prevent this unnecessary amplification of disinformation. We're increasingly seeing this as a key tactic during breaking news events, and we suspect the same will be true in the lead up to the elections. So unsurprisingly, I'm really sorry not to be there with you today. I had major surgery last month and my recovery has been slower than I'd hoped. Everything is fine, but the truth is I've been told by my doctors to avoid stress and I just know that listening to all of these discussions about the media and journalists at risk would have led to a risk to my own well-being. As some of you know, Barbie was my PhD supervisor. I did my PhD with her at Annenberg. And she continues to be my mentor and, who are we kidding, my official American mom with an O. So it's even harder not to be there as I'm so excited about the new center she's building there. So I'm not actually going to give you a full paper here, nobody wants that on a video stream, but I did want to offer a reminder about the need for all of us working in this space, academics and practitioners, to think about the importance of definitions, the language and terminology we use when discussing these issues. For most of last year, there was a constant battle to try and stop the use of the term F asterisk 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 news. <laughs> Margaret Sullivan wrote a great piece in the Washington Post very early in January 2017, just before Trump first used the term in the press conference calling out CNN. And around that time, a number of us wrote similar posts and articles, and at conferences, we were trying relentlessly to make the point that as this term was being used, first by Trump as a way to discredit any information he didn't like, but then we saw the same patterns by politicians and others around the world. We began to say that the news industry should be thinking much more critically about the use of the term as it was being weaponized against them. Research was starting to show the audiences, when asked, were increasingly associating the term with problematic or misleading mainstream news coverage not the type of content that academics and journalists were talking about when they were using the phrase. But when journalists would call us, as they did frequently to discuss F news, and I would explain that I would talk about the phenomenon but didn't use the term and advise that they didn't use it too, I was told every time that search engine optimization meant there was no way they could avoid the term. It was all about traffic. The industry showing that Silicon Valley's control over their profits prevented them from fighting back against the term being used against them. But it's now April 2018, and thankfully, we've seen a slight shift away from the term. I would argue this isn't about the reasons I've just outlined. It's actually a result of a growing understanding that it's less the fabricated content we should be worried about it's the data protection issues and micro-targeting that's the bigger concern than 
the moral panic that we saw about Macedonian teenagers creating fabricated new sites that looked like professional new sites. However, I do want to return to the importance of definitions. Earlier this year, I was a member of the EU Commission's high-level group on fake news. Uh, you can imagine my displeasure at that name. And we are a group of 39 people, representing almost every one of the EU's 28 countries. We were academics, print journalists, broadcasters, represented, representatives from civil society, and also from the technology companies themselves. And over the course of four day-long meetings in Brussels, the urgent need for definitions became stunningly clear. At the outset, we were told by uh, the EU staff, and we were told this in no uncertain terms, that the EU already has regulation around illegal speech, hate speech, extremist content. But our task was to decide what the EU should do about this type of legal speech. Now, in my own work, I've written about the differences between misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. And when I talk about disinformation, I set the boundaries around this is false information that is created or shared deliberately to cause harm. Now, this sounds great when you write that down in an article and you create a fun looking Venn diagram that gets shared on Twitter. It is harder when you're face to face with a very well dressed Italian lawyer demanding that you define harm for the purposes of building a watertight regulatory framework. Hours were spent in Brussels discussing what we mean when we use the term harm. And coming away from that experience and watching with horror as Emmanuel Macron talks about passing a fake news law, Brazil and Italy are bringing in the police to arrest people who share fabricated content, not creators, those who share. Malaysia has passed a law recently and India almost passed a law which fortunately got withdrawn due to the challenges of defining who a journalist is. Clearly they missed the early journalism conferences of the noughties, uh, where we spent long hours defining what's a journalist compared to a blogger. All of that to say, I used to enjoy our academic debates about these issues. They were intellectually challenging and fascinating. However, we no longer, I would argue, have the luxury of seeing these debates as interesting intellectual endeavors. Regulation is on the verge of being passed in many locations by politicians who have very little understanding of this issue and are driven by a palpable fear that their own re-election chances will be impacted by disinformation. These individual country inquiries and commissions are desperate for things that people in this room can help them with. Firstly, definitional frameworks that stand up to legal scrutiny and definitions related to different types of content, different types of harm and different types of technology companies. One of the reasons the discussions with Mark Zuckerberg on the Hill a couple of weeks ago was so frustrating is that until we can agree upon a definition of what these companies actually are, we're a long way away from effective and responsible regulation. But should we see them as utilities? Should we see them as data brokers, as common carriers, as publishers? None of these definitions work. And maybe, well, not maybe, certainly that's the issue. They're so new that I would argue they need to be considered as a new type of entity, as a new type of entity. But their functions are so diverse and distinct. Can we even place them in one bucket? When a company like Amazon does so many things, surely there are so many different regulatory frameworks that would need to be applied. Secondly, we need academic research that demonstrates the scale and impact of the whole ecosystem. And it has to be the whole phenomenon, ads, dark posts, memes, messaging apps, not just the parts of the problem that are easy to research. And we desperately need research that is carried out in locations other than the US. During our EU conversations, it was shocking that there was almost no research about the phenomenon in any EU country. We constantly had to draw on US research. Without any of these things, we face a very troubling reality that the information ecosystem will look very different to the one we currently have. And when I see the speed at which regulation is moving in countries around the world, it makes me realize that while these conferences are great, 
how can we actually turn these conversations into something that can actually tangibly help inform these discussions. So enjoy the rest of the, today's discussions. Again, I'm so sorry not to be there. And can someone give Barbie a congratulatory cuddle from me? <laughs> Thanks very much. I'm Claire Wardle, and I lead First Draft. <laughs> Okay, let's uh, open it up to questions. Same rules apply. Uh, please state your name and your affiliation. We'll do individual questions, and then if we still have a lot as we approach the end of the uh, session, we can uh, 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 group them together a little bit. So, yes. Um, I just wanted to throw out a, a couple of things to augment this and then ask, ask a question. So Pew in 2017 did an updated survey on media trust. 44% of Americans um, believe that the news at some point fabricates stories about Donald Trump. 31% um, of Americans believe that uh, with Trump's claim that the news media is an enemy of the people. Um, and with regard to questions of security, uh, in my own work, uh, we looked at 2,515 DC journalists, and only 2.5% of them solicited end-to-end -end communication um, on their Twitter bios, um, and only seven of them had a secure email listed. So that's just, uh, and of the secure drop opportunities, um, none of the television uh, stations, CNN, CBS, ABC, uh, had any sort of formal secure drop, and that was July 2017, so, so some of that may have changed. Um, but I wanted to, to ask the question about how trust is at risk, and I hate talking about trust in the way that the journalism community has framed this crisis of trust, but I want to think about the fact that trust is ultimately a risk. Right? To place trust in somebody is to take the risk in an unequal power distribution. And I'm wondering to what extent thinking about trust in this sort of nuanced idea, or not so nuanced, but as a concept of risk, feeds into all of these conversations. And then secondly, I'm wondering if we have to accept this new north-south global reality of just a messy world for, for press freedom and information, is there something that the global south uh, or more a sort of authoritarian pieces can tell us about how to interpret and understand a world of disinformation when you already have crossed that bridge where you no longer trust? Um, so, yeah. Uh, anyone like to start taking that set of questions on? Um, well, I can speak uh, at least to the um, security aspects of that. Um, I'm trying, I, I'm looking up to see whether we've added any um, television outlets in the last year, and I don't know for sure. Um, Bloomberg is kind of split, and, and they've got one. Um, but yeah, so the, the uh, with regard to encrypted email in particular, I think one of the things that uh, comes up a lot in the uh, in the journalistic context is something that the InfoSec community has been kind of dealing with for a long time, which is encrypted email is really hard and it doesn't work very well. And um, it's that uh, kind of problem that SecureDrop's designed to address. That uh, even if, so I've seen a lot of journalists do um, put their uh, PGP key in their Twitter bio, for example. And there's, there's a million ways to do it wrong. The sort, you're dependent on the source getting it right too. Um, so that stat is uh, less depressing than it might be. Uh, th the other ones are still depressing, don't worry. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, it's, th there's, a, th um, there's a lot of work to be done, and uh, a lot of this work, um, frankly, can't be happening at an individual journalist level. A lot of this has to be uh, something that where our infrastructure gets more secure, and that makes journalist source communications more secure, as well as everyone else's, um, because I do think w we will encounter those low numbers. Um, and then, yeah, the, the trust problem I'll let other people on the panel address. Do you want to? Um, I take your point, Nikki, that uh, trust is itself a risk. Uh, 
We know this from our love lives. <laughs> <laughs> I trust you, you know, you say to your partner, and that now you've just entered into a, a big risk. So yeah, trust is, trust is a risk. Uh, what I've been trying to tell journalists is um, that you have to give us more help in trusting you. So for example, when uh, reporters at uh, the Washington Post say, this account is based on 24 interviews with people in the administration who didn't want their names used. Um, we can trust the Washington Post with that kind of reporting, and we do. But other than the reputation of the Washington Post and possibly of the individual reporter, there's nothing that our trust can grab onto in that kind of account. And so uh, what I've been trying to argue is that um, transparency gives us more ways to trust. Uh, so if I not only um, tell you what I found in my reporting, but show my work, that's easier to trust. If I not only tell you about the data, but I put the data online, that is easier to trust. If um, you know that I'm not only going to report it, but I'm also going to correct it if it needs correcting, that is easier to trust. And so, yes, you have to take a risk by trusting, and you, and you take a risk by trusting journalists. But they can give you more help than they've been giving you in trust. And that is an evolution that our press is undergoing as it moves out of a system of authority in which you were trusted because you were professional, you were CBS News, uh, you, you had the microphone, you were one of the few people with a communication channel, so you were trusted yep. into a system where, with many speakers, you're trusted because you make it easy for people to trust you. Silvio Arzo, on the issue of whether the experiences um, in countries that have been dealing with this for a lot longer than we have? Uh, just a few, a few thoughts. I mean, I, I, two issues. One is that this sort of disinformation is always part of an active campaign. You know, so there's a textbook case. What, what we're seeing in this country is a textbook case of a collusion between politicians and uh, money elites and sort of part of civil society collectively mobilizing to do this kind of work that uh, Jay described. Um, nothing just happens just because. So it's not just one, one, one actor. And second is that what sort of people in government do actually makes, makes a huge difference because it legitimizes, it condones <coughs> attacks, uh, it sort of it empowers, it becomes sort of the new social norm, which makes it more difficult what, what we're saying. And what is striking is the similarities. I, I give sometimes this presentation on, on populism and the media, and I play a game, which is guess the populist. So I put a phrase, and who said that? Who did that? And it can be anywhere of the 20, 30 names that today we're, we define as populism in the sense of illiberal, and one of the striking sort of common features is exactly the position vis-a-vis -vis the press. That's the way to interpret, and that's what I was trying to emphasize, that against a collective movement against this, these issues, what is needed is a, is a counter movement. It's not just individual isolated um, uh, actions. And second, building off what Jay just said, what, how to rebuild trust when the media has been sort of weaponized discursively by a big part of society, that it's not just appealing to the trust of the traditional way of conceptualizing trust me, I'm a journalist kind of argument, but when the divide, when there's a fractured trust, when it is sort of grounded in, uh, in partisan ideological and other identities and is renewed constantly, then the question of trust me because I do what quote unquote, at least in the canon of professional journalism, journalists are expected to do, it's, insufficient. This is a much bigger problem. So journalists might not be very successful, and that's sort of one of Jay's point. Being failing even though they're succeeding in doing the job that many of us expect them to do. Um, 
I think from the Azerbaijani experience, uh, because over the years since independence, we've seen how independent media has been completely silenced. Um, we know that there are only a handful of media outlets where you can actually get independent news. And this makes it slightly easier uh, for the journalists who work for these outlets in terms of um, having this channel for communication with the audience. The authorities try to prevent uh, and, and, and get in the way of that communication channel by you know, first coming up with legal changes, um, you know, uh, launching uh, libel suits or uh, accusing the paper or the outlet of um, tax evasion and eventually shutting you down. Um, and then what you have left is having this online uh, platform where you can still continue um, having a communication. And then, again, in the case of Azerbaijan, you get a very skillful parliament who decides to uh, approve an amendment that blocks access to these remaining independent online or opposition news outlets, which really leaves the people without any access because internet was sort of this remaining uh, place where all of this conversation was <coughs> taking place. Um, but again, what's interesting is that because of the reputation of these outlets uh, that have been built over the years as independent outlets, an individual who's been um, illegally um, uh, taken, um, moved from his house, for instance, would call the journalists from the Radio for Europe Azerbaijan service or from Maidan TV because there is this trust uh, communication channel that's been established. And I think this sort of if within, within this authoritarian uh, state uh, that is Azerbaijan, um, it's, you know, you either watch what the government gives you because all of the television channels are government owned, or you try to find alternatives. And, and it's this constant ongoing battle between um, the government channels trying to bash independent media and independent media trying to find a way of actually building a line of communication with the people. That's great. Um, uh, Yef, and then did you ultimately? Yeah. Yef Lokish, Annenberg. This one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Fox News and to a, maybe to a lesser extent Breitbart I figured out that uh, attacking the media and also attacking immigrants and non-white people sells. That's one thing I didn't really hear is we talk a lot about changing norms and um, not, but there hasn't been much discussion about altering incent economic incentives. What is, is there anything that can be done on that front to alter economic incentives in an age of fragmented media? Well, um, like many people, I'm sure, in this room, uh, I woke up on November 9th in a state of despair. and. Um, felt like um, I had to go back and, and figure out where I took a wrong turn uh, and, and do something, you know, that might be um, constructive in some way. Uh, it took me a while to figure out what, what that was, but now I'm working with uh, a Dutch site, The Correspondent, which is the world's most successful member-funded news site. And um, they have 65,000 members who pay 70 euros a year because they believe in the kind of journalism that this site does. They have no ads, no tracking, no data collection, no billionaires, um, and nothing really except the members. Um, because of that, they don't engage in clickbait. They don't have to use any of the tricks for driving traffic that have done so much to course in public dialogue and uh, undermine trust. And they ground um, the site in the relationship between journalists and readers. That's the primary relationship. So for example, you follow writers at the site. You don't follow topics or sections. Uh, and each of the 21 full-time correspondents has to um, produce a weekly email to their followers that explains what they're working on and how far they've gotten in their investigation, as well as what knowledge needs they have and what sources they're looking for, and to create the relationship between the readers 
uh, and the right earns. Um, and they have aligned the incentives of the organization so that um, it isn't necessary for the journalists or the product to engage in attention grabbing. It's based more on attention granting. So they want to move to the United States, and I'm helping them do that. It, it, it's a different economic model. It's not subscription. This is the part that I want to emphasize. It's not subscription in that. Um, subscription is you pay your money, you get the product. If you don't pay, you don't get the product. Membership is different because the people joining the correspondent believe in the cause and support the work. They want it to spread beyond the members. So there's no strict paywall. There's no limit on how many articles you can share. There's no meter like there is with uh, the New York Times. Um, and this is not, it's not a solution to anything. It's not like this is the answer. It isn't, but it's just something that I'm doing, and the reason I'm doing it is because the entire incentive structure is aligned differently than the mass media as commercial model, the advertising driven model that has been the default for so long. And so I'm working with them to try and figure out if that can succeed in English language publishing. And um, we are going to launch the crowdfunding campaign for that English language site sometime in 2018. Uh, yes, right here. Uh, and my question is for Jay. I think um, I agree that sometimes international tours are opportunities for the international press to question their president. It is also opportunities for the American president to get swatted with a shoe mm. in other cases. So I think. Part of what I see as an international person moving to the U.S. Um, is part of the weakness is this assumption that the press in the U.S. is some sort of bulwark of objectivity, reality, freedom of speech, all this other stuff. And I think, yet again, we are overestimating some of these issues or treating them as new and, and underestimating a lack of freedom of the press that existed in the Obama administration or, you know, as, as your presentation showed. I think, you know, we don't question ourselves about what was going on before or the limits of speech before or the, de the, the systematic sort of um, horizons of what you can ask and what you can't ask it, within liberal democracies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, I take your point. Um, for one thing, the Obama administration was extremely aggressive in, in, um, in going after journalists in certain ways, especially through use of the Espionage Act. And there's no doubt that the freedom which, which they felt they could maneuver around those things helped create the conditions that, that we have now. But even, even more than that, I think, I didn't go into this in my talk because I think the threats coming from Trump's campaign to discredit the press are so big, but I didn't go into all the ways that bad practices before that moment had uh, led up to this. Uh, an example would, that I've tried to put a lot of, uh, of my own energy into was that it's, at a certain point, the political journalists in the United States, I think, l lost solidarity with the citizenry and began to see their job as informing us about what the political class was doing to manipulate the majority of the country. And I, I call that approach the savvy style of political journalism. And what the savvy style does is it tries to get the readers and the listeners and the viewers to join up with the political insiders in the game of manipulating the electorate along the lines of, you know, will this appeal work? Will the people in the suburbs of Philadelphia respond to that ad? What's the strategy? What are the tactics? That kind of journalism, which became the dominant form in Washington journalism, was a, uh, was a massive failure that went on for decades and is part of the reason that the, tr the press was in such a weak position when Trump the destroyer came along. Great, yeah. Um, there was one question here, then I'll go back to this side, yeah. You. Um, so this picks up on something on, uh, with Jason and others, but also questions that were raised yesterday. Um, I'm really concerned about the kind of masochism of 
journalists, especially television journalists, um, and you were talking about like this kind of desire for normality, where they have people on, they continue to have people on, like CNN with Kellyanne Conway, who are part, an integral part of the system of threat against them. This is a dynamic, and they don't seem to learn. Now, on the one hand, you know, in their defense, you say, well, they, they're doing that to combat what we talked about over this conference, this kind of two echo chambers, the polarization. But, but it, it's, it's the history of, you know, regimes of propaganda show that you must quarantine these dangerous, dangerous individuals immediately. And instead, we've had the opposite. So it's an open-ended question of how do, we, how do we manage this, how do we reach an equilibrium between you know, being, it's the partisan question. Like MSNBC, again, I'm not a TV critic, perhaps they also have Kellyanne Conway type people. I don't believe they do, but how do you manage this equilibrium in a way that doesn't threaten our democracy? So that's a small question. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone want to try to take that on? I mean, we can leave that as a kind of background. So, yes, Kathleen in the back. Jay, you oh, did you, I, I, sorry, Kathleen. Was there someone who wanted to take a shot at? I thought, Jay, you were beginning to lean forward. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, some, it's something I've written about. I wrote a whole uh, Twitter thread about it, um, which you can find on my, my Twitter uh, profile. Um, I, think, I, I think it's part of the threat. I tried to, men I tried to mention this as a threat, that there's a, there's a risk that our journalists won't act on things that are intended to erode their institution. That they will instead treat them in the frame of fairness and both parties and let's hear from everybody because this is a nice civil discussion and they won't rise <coughs> to the moment of threat. And I think that's a huge danger uh, and the, the example you point to is a perfect one. CNN found that its regular conservative commentators that had already had signed up when Trump was elected president, all of them were anti-Trump. They had a lot of conservative voices, but they were all anti-Trump. And they freaked out. Instead of asking themselves, why are all the people that we picked <laughs> anti-Trump? That's significant in itself. They immediately freaked and they had to sign up people who could, in an entertainment sense, a sitcom way, right, play the Jeffrey Lord, the crazy uncle who's always saying stupid things in defense of Donald Trump, right, which was an entertainment move. That's not recognizing the threat that you're, that you're facing. I'm, seeing it in I'm, seeing it. I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I really, I, I want to bring other people in. So Kathleen. No. Uh, Jay, Kathleen Hall Jameson of the Annenberg School. Uh, Jay, I agree with you that the fact checkers have had no effect on Donald Trump. Uh, so if you were running something hypothetically called factcheck.org, what would you do with your resources right now? <laughs> My mentor, Neil Toastman, taught me to ask, in what spirit do you ask this question? <laughs> uh, I really don't know. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't quit. Um, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't have a good answer for you. I, I think it's. I think it's. You know, the fact checking always proceeded um, as Glenn Kessler has said of the, of the Washington Post, under a, a rough assumption that if you call out a candidate or, or a president about something that's truly factually false, it's not that they will um, admit they were wrong, but they will change their behavior so as not to get censored by that judgment. And that was the way fact-checking worked up until the present moment. Uh, and now um, we're in a different world. So um, I wish I had a better answer. I don't. Uh, yes. Please, yeah. Magda Konieczna. I'm from Temple University. Um, I feel like all of you and, and people over the course of, of um, all of these meetings have done a really good job of addressing sort of the acute threat to journalists. Um, and I think a lot about sort of the less acute, kind of the slow drip erosion of the means of doing journalism, the challenges to the economic model. And I'm wondering, and, and some of you of course have talked about that as well, I'm wondering um, 
if there's something to be gained by thinking about sort of the acute physical danger um, alongside that sort of slow eroding danger, which is <coughs> portrayed, I think, in the U.S. as the outcome of the free market, but can be seen in different ways, I think. Any thoughts on um, that more kind of dripping of? Yeah, um, so I, I mentioned this briefly, but one of the things that I've been working on at Freedom of the Press Foundation is archiving work. And that is, in some, in some ways, it's very, you know, like cut and dry. I'm, I'm making sure the HTML files have a copy of them, you know, like, um, but uh, archiving, like, uh, like so many things, is political. And part of that has been a discussion with outlets and about outlets about what we consider to be endangered and what's threatened and the ways in which that's threatened and very frequently it is an economic thing very frequently it's it's a, an outlet that has just gone bust in some cases as we the thing that we're focusing on is a, a, a little more acute because it's the you know knife edge of that where it's the outlet got purchased or is or is being sued out of existence um, but in doing that I do interact with a lot of uh, newsrooms that are, that you know, <laughs> can't ignore the, the looming dread there. Um, and I will say it's been, uh, a lot of newsrooms are unionizing, which has been, you know, if you look at the way the journalists uh, talk about, the journalists in unionizing newsrooms talk about that process, it's compelling and it's encouraging. Um, and it, it sp speaking a little bit to the business model question, it's also, hopeful in a way that not a lot of things are around the media ecosystem are. So I, I don't think I don't think the answer I mean, I think the answer to a lot of things is probably unionization. Um, but I but I'm not I'm not saying that that's uh, that will get rid of the the general problems. Um, but that is one of the few areas where it kind of seems like that has led to a uh, an active force of people who <coughs> want to want news and journalism, not just media outlets, to continue to exist. Uh, I'm going to go back to this side. Yes, right here. Yes, please. Right. Yeah. yeah, hi. Um, Charlie Beckett from uh, London School of Economics. Um, I, I have to say quite a long question, but can't because Barbie will be crossing by don't for most of coming all the way from London to <laughs> <laughs> What I wanted to do is I want you to do my work for me, which is that I'm uh, leading a LSC commission into sort of public information crisis, and it's not unironically called the LSC Truth, Trust and Technology Commission. Um, and we're trying to, this has very, been incredibly inspiring, um, <coughs> the whole conference, not just this morning. And I want to pick up on sort of what Silvio's Feel like sort of carrying call at the end there for some kind of campaign, some kind of um, public engagement. And I'm wondering if you could come up with something for my commission. One concrete, <laughs> one concrete sort of strategic policy move. And it might be regulation or it might be, you know, a news organisation. Something concrete that they can do. But just to make it a bit tougher, I want you to try and come up with something that will address news gap, because I think a lot of the things we've been talking about are <coughs> effectively aiming at a kind of elite, or a, certainly even a liberal elite, a sort of boutique, quality, trustworthy journalism, when I think in a way the biggest uh, risk is that we're losing popular and tabloid good journalism, uh, or the good journalism is going away from the popular uh, media. And if you're going to count populism, for example, Surely we have to come up with something. So, can you give me something that I can stick in my report uh, that's coming out in the fall? Silvio, you want a second? Well, typically I don't work on Saturdays, but um, <laughs> <laughs> since you put me to work, I will try to do it. And then I will talk to people about forgiving me for, for working on Saturdays. So. Um, so, a few ideas. So, I mean, this has to be done at the, at the local level, and I don't think that there's no, sort of any sort of global formula because the situations are vary. One is how, you know, sort of you denormalize de de these kind of attacks that journalists live constantly. Um, 
not just among journalists, but among citizens and among political elites. And at least in the countries that I know better, political elites, economic elites are really badly informed about this. And journalists who work for large organizations in metropolitan areas are largely misinformed, disinformed about this. Citizens have no awareness of this issue. Once in a while, we'll read something that somebody got shot or harassed or something like that. So the question is that because of the drip, 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 it might be too late, but it's never too late to how you denormalize de this in different ways with different publics, right? That's, that's one way to, to do it. Second is actually assessing the effectiveness of these sort of mechanisms, institutional mechanisms for alert and for, um, I give examples of the, the legal framework about trying some of these attacks, the fact that now journalists five believe that you know anybody is attacked on, online. Will you report that or not? It's just part of, you report when you figure out that things are really escalating rather than along the way. Um, so that's the new world in which we are. Not only bring awareness about this, but actually assessing the, the, the impact of what we have in place, assessing the impact of this training, all this stuff. The organizations that I know better, they get money, funding, to actually do the work rather than primarily to assess the impact of this work. Um, for a variety of reasons that anyone who has worked, I don't know, in NGOs, international, they will know what, where, where the money goes on this. Um, then asking journalists, ask journalists, what is it that realistically can do? In my experience, many of these things are not are done primarily because it is the assumption that they will make a difference in everyday's life, as opposed to asking journalists, really tell me what will make a difference next time you are harassed. That is not that goes beyond the social media alerts or sort of the hotline and all this stuff. Uh, rather than figure it out in a, in a room with people who design something. So it's a question of public engagement with the people who actually are at the front lines of, of what we're discussing. Uh, and finally is, what do we re to what kind of harassment or attacks do we react? Um, because nobody, not everybody is similarly at risk depending on given societies. And my, after being in this conference, my sort of conclusion is that basically we react with certain kinds of people who look certain way, who do certain work, who have certain contacts or certain political and social capital. When they are attacked, then this becomes a bigger issue. Not with people who don't have, because where they live, they look different. I mean, all kinds of issues. Uh, and that is sort of what we badly need, sort of, sort of turning the tables around and saying, well, this, this is the issue. We don't have to wait until somebody who looks, quote unquote, like, like us is attacked for the issue to become an issue. Um, that's what comes to mind right now. Um, can I add something uh, which in a different, different part of, uh, maybe a different chapter of the report? Um, <laughs> Uh, there's, I think it's tempting to look at when you're talking about uh, what's the truth, technology, and, um, you know, trust. and trust. Uh, it's tempting to look at the worst part of that, um, and I think some of that is what Jay described as the 30% of people that are, you know, tuned out by the time the journalist shows up. Um, but uh, another big chunk of this, of course, is people. There's a there's a tremendous appetite for people who do want. Uh, good journalism and who want local journalism. And I, I think about, so, sorry to bring it up again, but um, you know, I live in New York and when Gothamist was shut down one day, Gothamist was a profitable publication, it was shut down all of a sudden and there aren't local journalists going to city hall meetings in New York City. And the, I mean, it's, it's certainly some, but, but uh, there are a lot of things that, that were covered by Gothamist where that's not there, there's nobody there anymore. And so there's, there's room for, I think, people who are a receptive audience, who are not, you know, you don't have to fight them to, to you know, <laughs> shove the broccoli down their throat. There's people who want to eat uh, healthy, um, news diet-wise, and that's their, uh, there's important things that can be done there too. And just as a coda on the Gothamist thing, it's being reopened um, in partnership with a public radio station. And so, there, so that, was a, that was a, like, funding model change um, that's enabling that. I have two quick things for Charlie. One is, check out the Bristol Cable. The Bristol Cable is a local news cooperative. 
Um, it's attracting people who are not already educated, upper middle class. They have um, local control over the production. And one of the things they do is they teach people how to do some of the journalism for themselves, which I think is very interesting, almost like a community organizing, community development married with local journalism. So it's not a model, but I would definitely tell your commission to check it out. The other point I would make is it's a very important political fact in the U.S. predicament that the Republican Party, Republican elites, Republican leaders have not themselves objected to Trump's campaign against the press. They, they do not create friction for that, and the fact that they are in default on that makes it possible for this thing to go on. And so one of the answers has to be that both sides or all sides of the political spectrum have to realize the importance of public interest journalism. And it's been a massive failure of the Republican Party in the United States. Great. Uh, yes, right here. Checked a tiny little note of optimism, which is that nothing's static. Not a lot. Just hear me out. <laughs> and that you know, repression ebbs and flows, and that I, I think during these grim times we tend to think, oh, it's all going downhill, which it is, but it can also go uphill again. And I just want to give a couple of historical um, examples. When you think about the military dictatorships in Argentina, Brazil, Nigeria, just to name a few, there was no press freedom, and it's quite robust now. In Look at Russia during the Soviet Union. You had no press freedom. And then during the brief Yeltsin years, it came back. Now we're back with Putin. But, but certain seeds of freedom have already been set. And I think we have to hold on to those things. The current political climate is so toxic, but Trump is not going to be here forever. And I'm not thoroughly, you know, I know my husband says he's actually going to be in power for 12 years, not eight. But, but the thing is, you know, he has created much of the toxicity of public debate, and it, it hopefully it will not be permanent. And there's one other point I want to make, which is something that um, I've been talking a lot with the Committee to Protect Journalists, which is that we only really began to take make records of attacks and threats against the media in the 1990s. And it was with the rise of internet that we could document this. And when I think back to the countries that I've worked with back in the 70s and the 80s, look at Lebanon in the 80s. I mean, it was... You know, that situation's gotten better. Mexico, arguably, in the 70s when I worked there, was no worse than it is today. So the question is, are we simply done? Now, definitely the situation's deteriorated in places like the United States and Syria, without a doubt. But the question I wanted to pose is, are we keeping better records, and therefore we think the situation has gotten worse, or has it always been in many of these countries pretty dire? So that's just what I'm posing, and I don't have an answer to that. So you can answer it. We are keeping better records, and I think I, I, that's not an either or to me. I think and things are getting worse, but I do. I I, I think that right now, um, in this moment in history, uh, acknowledging or d spending too long discussing history looks like um, it, it, it's you know an, uh, a rhetorical cousin to whataboutism, which I don't think you, you're doing, and I, I'm certainly not trying to do. But uh, to say that some of the things we're seeing are the latest in a trend uh, is true, and trends can reverse over time, um, which is also true. But it's, I, I think things are, things are bad. Uh, <laughs> S Silvio, did you want to jump in on yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, that's part of the reason why I was sort of pushing to see it as a human rights issue, because if you look at the human rights literature, what you just mentioned is at the center of the current debate. Are, is, are things better or worse now? And why? Is it because we know more? Because we document more? So it is between a more sort of uh, positive argument, in spite of all the challenges that we have been discussing, and a more pessimistic sort of view. Um, what is my take on this? I'm sort of inclined to be skeptical of the more optimistic version, in spite of recognizing this. And probably because what Kafka said, that there is optimism, but there is not for us. Um, <laughs> And the reason why is because if you think that, yes, things are better if you compare to military dictatorships and totalitarian regimes, what is the yardstick of how much progress we could have made by now? That's a hypothetical question, but it seems to me it's a legitimate question. Are we comparing to what the situation was in some countries 40, 50 years ago in terms of basic fundamental 
uh, speech rights, communication rights. Right. Is that enough to say, yeah, we are better in spite of everything? I, I'm not convinced, right? Um, not because it might lead to sort of, oh, maybe it's a bump along the road and eventually, you know, after somebody's off power, I mean, things will get better. I mean, because if we look at the more structural issues, then it's not something that will easily change because somebody is in government or someone is not in government. And that's what worries me. It's about, if you look at the structural long-term issues, there is probably, I mean, there is not enough evidence to be, to conclude that we are better than we were before. I grew up in a military dictatorship in the 1970s in Argentina. And yes, but I mean, it doesn't make me happy to say, well, you know, come down. I mean, things are better now, right? I said, compared to what, right? 40 years after, you know, so that's why in that debate in the human rights literature, I not tend to side completely with the pessimists, but I take, to take with a grain of salt, big grain of salt, the more optimist argument. I mean, uh, Catherine Sinking has you know, a very compelling interest in a book called Evidence for Hope, came out a few months ago, which you know, she makes an argument that things are better. She provides plenty of evidence. But then the question is, is that comparing to the past the only sort of measurement we, we conclude, and even if we conclude that things are better, so what do we do next, given the sort of the multiple challenges that we have been discussing here? Can I, or oh, maybe? Oh, no, I'd like to follow uh, back of the room, and then we'll go right here. Um, hi, uh, Samantha Oliver. I'm a PhD student here at Annenberg. I have a question for Arzu. Um, we've spent a lot of time today talking about the risks that are kind of bound up in the relationship between um, journalists and the public. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about the relationship between journalists and the public in Azerbaijan and how that relationship might contribute to or relate to risks for journalists doing work there. And why don't you also ask the question that you were going to ask too, so we get two on the table. Yes. Yeah. Um, Ronana Zanwitz, I'm a filmmaker. Um, this is inspired both by everything that was said that was said in this panel and the digital panel yesterday. Uh, the dark thing that comes out of it is that both all this oppression and the opposition are part of the business model of the platform. And I'm wondering if the movement that you are suggesting, Silvio, shouldn't, I mean, if all the, the journalism and the activism and the criticism shouldn't be pointed much more directly at the platforms because maybe they would care. Um. So either of those questions, anyone want to uh, uh, address them? Uh, just to clarify, the question was about the relationship between journalists and the public. Yeah. Um, it's a very complicated relationship um, in Azerbaijan uh, because if you have a very, um, uh, if you work with, say, independent outlet, uh, like, um, as a service for Radio for Europe or Maidan TV or Turan, um, you um, have a, a certainly much more transparent channel of communication with the public uh, because public knows who you are. I mean, these are the journalists. As I said earlier, it's it's really a handful of journalists. So everyone knows that you know Khadija is an investigative journalist. Um, you know, Emin Mili is the head of the uh, Maidan TV, which is a outlet based uh, out of Berlin. Um, and you know, these people work for these outlets. Um, it's a very open channel of communication. And if a journalist wants to do a story, for instance, they are um, th they have sort of this backup when they name that. Um, channel to the person that they want to do the story with or the interview. It gives you this sort of support. Um, this is not the case if you're speaking with a government official, for instance. If you call them, like I did during the elections, asking them about the, co they were covering the, the camera in the precinct with a paper while they were putting a ballot box with votes. And it was cut on cameras. And I, I called the chair and I asked, well, you were, you know, I, I work for Radio for Europe, and as soon as I said it, you know, I could sense this like tension in his voice, and he's like, "Yes, yes." And then he started saying that there's noise in the background, um, and then he was like, "Okay, I'm back." And then he said, "Well, no such thing happened." And I'm like, "Are you really sure there was no paper over the camera because that's what everyone saw?" And like, "No, it was a technical glitch." And, you know, this went online because that was, you know, we, we recorded his voice and so that went into the story. 
Um, so there's this type of connection and relationship that you have. Like when you call a government official, they always are freaked out that someone from the radio for your Azeri service is calling them or from Aidan TV is calling them. But when you call the public and someone from you know, a remote village reporting on the electricity cuts that the government says uh, do not exist, uh, you always have this sort of um, you know, evidence, basically, uh, to collect and, and, and counter the arguments of the um, officials. Anyone on the second uh, question that was raised? Well, I, I think there would be a lot of value um, in, in wrestling with the platforms, in focusing in on, on one aspect of, of how they operate, which is their terms of service uh, documents. Because the existence of those documents, especially in the case of, of Facebook, uh, allows them to secure a kind of consent that is uninformed consent, which we don't actually have a great deal of literature about. We have, we have a lot of understanding of how force works, and we have a, a lot of understanding of how informed consent is supposed to work, but we don't really think much about uninformed consent, which is what most people who are using these platforms are actually giving them. And there's a connection there to the 30% I talked about, because those, those people want uninformed consent too. They, they don't actually, they want to push journalism away. So the, um, the terms of service documents are legalese, they're, you know, we check them, we, um, we have no idea what we're signing or signing away. Um, and they lead to this condition of sort of semi-trust or injured uh, trust or, or uninformed consent. I think if, if pressure was put on, on Facebook to start actually telling people what's going on in those, in those agreements and uh, transparency and plain language uh, came over and um, they, had to, they, had to, they had to change, that would be a positive thing. And this could happen because the new European rules have a provision that mandates plain language in those kinds of key documents. It's not a cure-all, it's, it's, it's not a big thing, but it might be a small thing to start changing our relationship with the, with the platforms. And it's something that academics could work on. Not that we're so great at plain language, but. All right, I'm gonna take a bundle of you right here, uh, and then in the back of the room, and then right here. Dan Brinberg, University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, since it didn't come up that much on the panel, I was hoping some of you could speak to the risks particular to reporters of war and, and violent conflict, um, particularly thinking about uh, are there ch challenges and risks that are changing as the ways are being, that war is being waged are changing and the access to those wars are changing. Um, then if, also if you see the coverage changing as a result of those risks and if there is any kind of tools or training that are particular to those precarious and uh, Nelson Kimayo from the Catholic University in Lisbon. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak a bit about uh, the Trump effect abroad and when it comes to uh, threatening uh, the media. Uh, what I mean is how groups and politicians that have been attacking the media, they feel now legitimized by what is happening in the U.S. Because as Jay mentioned in his talk, the U.S. was perceived as this model for liberal democracy and free press. And uh, I wonder if this is not transitioning somehow into a model for attacking the press. And uh, let me just give one example. Um, in Europe, of course, I mean, we have our own share of author authoritarian governments and pro-authoritarian <coughs> politicians. But even those who are committed to democratic uh, institutions, uh, today they seem to be saying things that uh, I have never heard in my life. And just one example from my own country, we have a left-wing <coughs> prime minister who is very popular in polls. He has clearly a left agenda. And in the last months, there have been lots of reports on the media about shortcomings in the national health system. And his reaction was, we don't have a problem in the health system, we have a problem in news reporting. Now, this would have been something considered outrageous for a prime minister in office to say uh, two uh, years ago. But the reaction was, there was almost no reaction. It was just normal. So uh, 
I would like to know if you would say something about how you perceive the impact that the U.S. model uh, is having abroad. And the last question for this group. Hi, Ellery from Global Voices. <coughs> Silvio, I was very um, intrigued by your presentation, and I think that the framing, the, the ability to talk about human rights, not in an abstract sense, but actually, you know, we have this robust global international human rights doctrine and regional human rights bodies. And in the United States, nobody talks about that stuff. It is, it is a term that I find when I'm in US media circles. People are like, oh. it sort of sounds like a thing that the rest of the world thinks about and that we just, mm -hmm. So I was wondering if, I mean, Arzu and Parker, you both, I mean, you're my friends and we, we both encounter that we all encounter this from different angles and I just I wondered if you could like talk to us a little bit about what's going on with that could it change um, could could media in the United States start to have more consciousness about human rights and the fact that that they like really matter here too and maybe to take some cues from media in other parts of the world on that all right, so we've got three questions on the table. Anyone can uh, address any part of those if you'd like. Uh, Silvio, do you want to start on that last one? Okay. Then we'll come, maybe we'll come right down the... These are, these are great questions. Um, let's see, on the reporters at war, I mean, I, that's not my part of uh, specialization, but I've always been struck, um, again, something that I mentioned earlier, when <laughs> the issues become relevant, when Western reporters are attacked or the victims rather than the people that who work typically with them, non-Western reporters and local reporters, not only what happens during sort of the attacks or the, but after the Western media is gone and you know moves somewhere else. So for every, to me it's like is a need for a sort of a bifocal view on this issue. That it's not just about foreign correspondence, it's about sort of global journalism and what happens to the local journalists once the attention goes somewhere else. Uh, second, uh, yes, you're absolutely right. There was an article in the Washington Post a few days ago that had sort of a list of uh, current political leaders sort of using a very similar Trumpian language uh, about their own media. So again, I mean, the question is that it normalizes sort of globally certain kind of practices that probably there is a strong tradition or weak tradition in individual countries, but it now seems like you know it's okay, it's legitimate to actually engage in that kind of um, public discourse. Um, and the third one, the question is, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. The question that human rights, the, I mean, I will guess that probably in this country, because these questions have been traditionally seen as part of the big family of freedom of the press and First Amendment, there has been sort of some challenges to reframe it in terms of human rights issues rather than just a question of speech and expression in the spirit of the First Amendment, or at least in the interpretation of the First Amendment. Uh, how do you turn that around? Because I think to me it's a much more sort of useful ways of sort of dealing with the nuances of what we're talking about here, which is not just about speech in the very orthodox almost libertarian way of thinking about this question, but it's a question of communication rights. Uh, I have no good ideas how you, how you do that, because you are sort of basically battling sort of a very dominant hegemonic way of thinking about this, these questions, and a very sort of, I would say, different tradition of thinking about this, and in my mind, you sort of run out of way of understanding if you take that libertarian tradition when looking at many of the problems that we have been discussing now. In countries instead with risk, with human rights, with this, that, that kind of language, it has a longer tradition. In some ways, it's sort of more obvious that you will see it. I mean, the problems that we have been discussing for the last day and a half as a question of human rights, rather than a question which, where what happened to speech rights gone, gone wrong? That, that's not the right way to understand this. Arzu, any of the three questions you'd like to address? Um, sure, actually, uh, risks and war reporting. I mean, one of the reasons why um, OSCE or Dear Mission and dissidents and journalists are often accused of being Armenian agents or working for the Armenian government is because Azerbaijan is in an active state of war with Armenia. And the risks of reporting on Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, um, especially objectively, are quite high. 
um, when in April 2016 there was a four-day war, um, the only two uh, independent outlets that reported facts based on the reporting from journalists both from Armenia and Azerbaijan got blackmailed by the authorities. They were accused of uh, uh, subjective reporting. They were accused of um, blowing up the numbers of the soldiers who died and, and the citizens who were uh, being killed because the government wanted to keep the facts really under control. Um, and it's, you know, we don't really have active war reporters because of this, because you'll become an immediate target. And this is something that is very sacred for a lot of Azerbaijanis and for Armenians, because the conflict has been going on pretty much since we gained independence and even before that. Um, so I don't really see the cover changing, because it's, it's the same type of coverage that we've been seeing. If not, it's gotten worse, because in the mid-90s, there was far more dialogue between the two governments, where, you know, journalists could travel to the uh, to the front line uh, from both ends and actually exchange notes and, and, and talk to people. And now this is not happening because if you do this without a permission from the government, you can actually be jailed for that. Um, so that's really interesting to see this, this sort of, you know, it's almost like a black hole. We don't know much uh, of what's going on. Now about the Trump effect, I think um, if anything, I think our politicians are teaching um, politicians here on how to be more authoritarian and how to make more uh, increasingly unsensical statements. Um, so I don't, yeah, I think the reaction has been the other way. If actually the Trump administration has given far more um, um, sort of this self um, uh, I, I can't, I'm blanking on the word, but for Azer Azeri uh, government officials feel a lot more comfortable in saying the things that they say. I mean, they were saying these things for a really long time now. I mean, we've lived under this regime for 20 years uh, plus. Um, but having Trump, uh, of course, it's really damaged the, the institution of the civil society as a whole, and it's given more power to the government officials. And on the last question, um, about more consciousness. I think, um, I don't really have um, an answer, but I think it's really important to look at the experiences of other countries who've been struggling and who've been trying to bring in the conversation around human rights um, into public debate. Um, and I think, you know, I have a lot of American friends or journalists who are telling me now that, oh, we now understand what you've been going through. And I think it's this kind of <laughs> experience sharing that needs to be brought into the conversation and be open to the public here. Uh, Parker? Okay, um, I'm gonna go uh, a little bit quickly for um, sake of time, uh, and I'm not gonna speak to the Trump effect, sorry. And actually, my answers to the first and second questions are uh, interact in a funny way. Uh, so risks particular to reporters of war, obviously uh, physical risks um, outside of my scope. Um, it's a high surveillance environment, and it's an environment where uh, there you cannot count, especially on the rule of law. Um, and so, technical solutions. You know, if you if, if if it would be catastrophic for your notes to leak, um, you need to make sure those notes are encrypted in a way that you know, even if it would be legally uh, inappropriate for someone to take the notes, if they physically can, then you know. So in, in many ways, it parallels other uh, high surveillance, low rule of law environments, which is, you know, border reporting. Like, um, and so, yeah, we have, um, at Freedom of the Press Foundation, we talk to a lot of people who are in similar environments, and that's, that's what you have to take into account. Uh, the reason why I think that's sort of a funny interaction with the, with the human rights question is because, I, yeah, echoing what Silvio said, um, uh, a long history of sort of uh, liberty and especially I previously worked for a California-based nonprofit, which, uh, you know, had in its, in its DNA the California ideology of, of, um, of a sort of uh, left-sounding libertarianism. Uh, and it's, you know, a lot, a, lot of, uh, a lot of its ideals and a lot of our ideals are constructed as freedom from. Um, and when you have a freedom from environment, that's not uh, as conducive to human rights. And I think a lot of that has to do with the uh, economic models of philanthropy in the U.S. And that has been very beneficial in some ways. Um, but if you are not adjacent to an industry uh, that wants freedom from some kind of, you know, 
regulation, uh, it's hard to get money to run your nonprofit. And there's no, you know, human rights factory that is going to have employees, you know, and I'm not even talking about nefariously. I just mean, you know, if you work in digital rights, as I have for a long time, employees of, uh, of tech companies understand and value your work. And they will, they, you know, their employees and CEOs will help pay for that work. And so that, that does lead to a, um, yeah, this, this environment where you are mostly focused on, yeah, freedom from regulation, which is not the obviously only construct. Okay. Jay? That's a very good point about freedom from. Um, I don't have any knowledge about the uh, risk of war correspondence. Uh, but I do want to respond to this question about the Trump effect. Peter Baker uh, is the dean of White House reporters in the United States. He's the White House correspondent for the uh, New York Times. And at a conference like this a few months ago, um, he was saying that um, he understands why people get upset about Trump uh, attacks on the press, but um, really doesn't affect me too much, he says, and he characterized those attacks as just theater. Those are the words he used. It's just, it's just theater. And I thought this was amazing and just like off the charts complacent attitude from the very top of the professional hierarchy because of what you said, that that the most dramatic effects of Trump's hating on the press are in this reversal from the United States and the United States press as a kind of beacon in the world, even though it was filled with imperfections and dark sides to its own history, a kind of beacon or model to the world to the reverse where Trump's behavior is now enabling and uh, justifying um, regimes to uh, restrict the press and, and try their own tra tactics of hatred uh, towards it. It's just, it's an astonishing uh, reversal and it's one of the darkest um, episodes that have resulted from his uh, election. Um, finally, on this question about human rights, I think Silvio is totally right that we should start to think about these issues with journalists as human rights problems. I think that's completely on point. But part of the reason that you get this reaction has to do with something Barbie has studied a lot and I've studied a lot, which is professionalization in journalism. And American journalists develop their professional identity by pushing off against other figures that they see themselves as not being. And they, they use everybody for this. Uh, they do it with academics. They, they push off against academics uh, because academics, um, for example, don't speak in a public language and journalists do. So that's what makes us different. Um, and they do it with politicians, obviously, right? Where I'm not part of your party and I'm not part of your party. I'm pushing off from both parties and that creates professional space for me to be in the middle, as I said yesterday. Um, and one of the groups that they push off against to create their own identity is activists, uh, especially in saying that journalism is not advocacy. I'm sure you heard this a zillion times. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's been true for a long time. This, that what's different now is that in order for their institution to find the support it needs to survive in an atmosphere of threat and attack, Journalists need allies. Where are they going to get these allies? From the very people they've been pushing off <laughs> to create their professional identity. This is a big problem in the profession of journalism right now. But the good news, to get to your point, is that they're kind of sort of realizing this. They need friends. They need friends. A is there a song there? <laughs> <laughs> You've got a friend. Um, yeah, so they need friends, and so there's a bit of an opening there. Like an example would be, they're very aware now that their readers are their friends because they're paying more of the freight, of the cost of news gathering, right? With through subscription and uh, at times meter and other things like that. And they're kind of aware that now well, we really need you. And for most people in the world, they had to be aware of 
who they needed in order to survive. Journalists lived for this long time in this kind of fairy tale world where their business model was great and they had this space and they controlled production as well as distribution and now all that is coming crashing down and so there's, po there's a possible opening there. But you still see this attitude flare up where journalists will say, we're not activists and we have nothing to do with activism. Well, good luck saving your institution with that. <laughs> So I'm cognizant of the time, even though we started a little late, and I know we could go on for quite some time, but I'm going to give Barbie uh, the last question. Uh, yeah. First of all, I, I keep saying the same thing, I'm getting very boring, but man, thank you. I mean, this panel was absolutely terrific, and it's just really gratifying to see how each of the four panels went their own direction, you know, kind of groveled into their own texture and came up with really interesting insights. So thank you to all of you, um, including Claire, whoever she is. Um, <laughs> so I have, I have a kind of unfair question, but I'm going to ask it anyways. I mean, we <laughs> programmed you guys, the journalism panel, last because I didn't want everybody to do what I thought they would do, which is think about journalism. And yet, I think I was right because, of course, we've been talking about journalism, as Michael said, all the way along. Have you learned anything from the other panels? <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. Have you learned anything from the other panels that strikes you as fundamentally different from what we think of as media practitioners at risk when they are in journalism? And I know that the panels aren't easily distinguishable, they blend themselves, but I'm wondering if there's anything that you heard that made you kind of sit up and say, hmm, that's different. To an, un an unfair question, I will give an unfair answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's the unfair answer. <laughs> the, probably a better answer is exactly what is it that I learned. That is the question of, you know, how do we define, a, the common thread to me is, who is on the line? Who defines who is on the line? Right? And what has, I mean, and sort of the ways that we understand what the problem is. And probably one of the things that the center could do is to contribute to the conversation in a way that we understand what risk is, to what extent media workers, journalists, and, and others think or do not think, or think that sort of risk is part of, you know, part of what you do, as opposed to a fundamental human rights problem. Um, that is something that seems to me that, it, I mean, consistently heard that in, in different panels, even though the specifics were about sort of different issues. Um, entertainment mm -hmm. industry. Uh, I mean, I, I felt really close with the panel on digital and documentary, and of course today journalism is what I do. But the entertainment uh, panel was quite interesting in a sense that, you know, I. You watch these, these talk shows and you have a laugh, especially when they poke fun of the president here and you wish that you know, such programs existed in countries where I'm from and where I live, uh, but you know that it's not possible. Uh, but you, you know, don't ask the question of you know, the risks within this industry. So that was, that was interesting for me on a personal level. Um, I think that uh, there's a degree to which um, a lot of uh, people, especially people affiliated with institutions in journalism, um, are facing the same risks as many of the other uh, categories of media that, that we've talked about, but have not yet been as um, creative in their response. And I think some of that is pr precisely what Jay was just talking about, where they have boxed themselves into uh, a professional identity that relies on uh, more of a uh, code of conduct in a sense, um, which is many of which uh, many of the elements of that code are very good, um, but uh, there hasn't been uh, hearing about some of the examples from the other panel of of ways that um, documentary, uh, especially filmmakers and people in the entertainment industry, are addressing those risks. I was a little. I, I, I'm looking forward to when uh, when journalists and journalistic institutions. Uh, are that sort of free thinking about it? The answer is yes. <laughs> I can't remember which panel it was, but there was, there was a point where one of our, one of our speakers was talking about um, the, the forms of popular culture that actually grab attention now, uh, which are usually not text-based. Um, 
And it made me think that uh, the, world of, the, the world of people who care about truth and verification is much larger than the world of journalism. And what we really need are verification troops who can go out and fight that battle. And only a portion of them, a small portion of them, are going to be journalists. So like a really good example is John Oliver, who makes these arguments. They're about stuff that's true in the world. He has journalists on his staff. He cares hugely about verification because he doesn't want to put a fact in there that somebody can say was made up or you know, doesn't withstand scrutiny. Uh, and I think what we want, what we need is like an alliance among people in entertainment, in documentary, in activism, in journalism, all of whom start from a, like a, almost like a holy belief in the power of verification, like this actually happened. You can't, um, you can't wipe it away. You can't say it didn't happen because it did happen. Uh, and I think the verification troops, as it were, are many, um, and they have to kind of like fight together. And really, journalism is like one division, one wing. And I'd like to just add to that Soraya's opening keynote where I think the question, who defines risk, is one of the crucial ones. Um, her answer that um, it's often the same people who get to define almost everything and uh, the, the problem that uncovers as to going forward, not just in the case of, of, uh, of gender and women, which is obviously crucial, but in terms of looking to other parts of the world, in terms of looking at risk that's faced by other um, underserved, uh, underprivileged uh, uh, groups in the various societies we look at, that going forward, that first question needs to be answered in a more holistic and open way as well. So thank you very much. Thank you all very much. We can now go to lunch. <laughs>